Good morning, and can I welcome members to the 19th meeting in 2017 of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee. Uh, agenda, agenda item one today is a decision on whether to take item six, which is a discussion on Commission on Parliamentary Form. Notes from the clerks, uh, if we can agree to take that and further papers on the Commission on Parliamentary Form in private at future meetings. Thank you for your agreement. Agenda item two is for the committee to agree that it, its consideration of its approach to inquiry into sexual harassment and inappropriate conduct at the Scottish Parliament should be taken in private at a future meeting. Do members agree to take this item in private? Mm -hmm. Thank you. And our third item today is for consideration on a proposed cross-party group on consumer protection for home energy efficiency <coughs> And renewable energy and I would welcome Claire Hockey MSP to the meeting. Um, Ms Hockey is the proposed convener of the group and I would invite uh, Ms Hockey to make an opening statement about the purpose of the group. Thank you convener and thank you to the committee for um, meeting with me this morning. Over the past year MSPs have become aware of historic and ongoing issues relating to the UK government's 2012 to 2015 Green Deal initiative which has affected hundreds of consumers throughout Scotland. Consumers have been experiencing severe financial issues arising out of the alleged mis-selling of energy efficiency products. Many of these consumers have been left without redress, either due to their suppliers going into administration or difficulties in obtaining resolution through the various ombudsmen and agencies who are meant to address malpractice. In my constituency of Rutherglen, solar panels were widely sold to householders in Blantyre by an approved Green Deal operator which has since gone into administration. People were told they would not pay any more for their electricity, that they could save money and that they were helping the environment. So far, 60 individuals have attended a series of public meetings that I have organised in conjunction with the Local Citizens Advice Bureau in Blantyre. Attendance at those meetings quickly expanded to include disillusioned solar panel customers from Hamilton and from other areas. Feed-in tariffs, the money that householders were owed for generating surplus electricity, were signed over to a third party with little, if any, explanation to the purchasers. Householders will have to repay the cost of the panels for up to 25 years through their electricity bills. I have seen one contract that specifically states that the feed-in tariffs pay for the panels. Many people not only signed over their feed-in tariff, but are paying for their panels again through a finance deal. Green Deal finance debt rests with the property, not the individual householder, and this has led to householders experiencing serious, serious conveyancing and legal issues when they're trying to sell their properties. Multiple issues have emerged, including customers' bills tripling in many instances, poor workmanship, problem with building warrants that were not applied for by the installing provider and lack of maintenance, particularly since the main provider went into administration. Simultaneously, in Glasgow North constituencies, MSP colleagues were experiencing similar issues, again affecting dozens of customers, although the main issue there was mainly related to external wall cladding, uh, wall insulation or cladding products. Uh, we have also been contacted by customers from many other areas of Scotland and indeed other parts of the UK who are experiencing similar issues. Citizens Advice Scotland have recognised that there are considerable consumer issues relating to energy efficiency products and schemes that require to be addressed. The CPG will seek to look at the issues of redress for customers affected by these historic Green Deal related issues. However, it is also important to ensure that lessons are learned so that similar issues are not replicated with the introduction of new schemes, particularly since the UK Government is poised to relaunch the Green Deal through the now privatised Green Deal Finance Company. With the UK and Scottish governments encouraging consumers to improve the energy efficiency of their homes through grant schemes or finance deals, it is important that customers have confidence in these initiatives. Thank you very much. Can I ask if there are any questions from the committee this morning? Yeah, could, could I possibly ask, um, is, do you see this as a CPG that might have a limited lifespan, given the nature of, of, of the problems that you're, you're trying to address? I would certainly hope so, uh, Convener. Um, I would certainly hope that this will, this will be a, a, a limited amount of time and that we'll, we'll be able to get some redress, but also instill some confidence in Green Deal initiatives going forward. Thank you. Any further questions? 
Yes, Ms. Folks. Short one. Um, in terms of um, how, you, why you think a CPG in particular is the best way to take these issues forward. Well, although myself and Ivan McKee, MSP, um, have held public meetings in our, in our own constituencies relating to those issues, we have uh, both been approached by um, constituents from right throughout Scotland. Um, so this is, this is an issue that I think we're only seeing the very tip of the iceberg. So we, we would hope through this CPG, we would be raising awareness amongst MSP colleagues, but also it's giving us an opportunity to, uh, with the... the um, other members of the CPG um, is letting us raise this at an, at, on a national level. Okay, thank you. Um, can I thank you very much for your attendance at the committee this morning? Um, the committee will consider whether to approve the application uh, at agenda item five, and you'll be informed of our decision as quickly as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'll just suspend briefly while the witnesses change over. Thank you. Um, we now move to agenda item four, uh, which is to take evidence from Dougie Wands, the acting, acting lobbying registrar, on a draft parliamentary guidance and code of conduct for lobbyists. Um, I would welcome Mr Wands to the committee. He's no stranger to our committee, but uh, different to be on that side of the, the table today. Um, but um, we'd be delighted if you could make an opening statement. Thank you very much, convener, and good morning. Um, I hope it will be helpful if I say a few words uh, by way of introduction to this item of business. Uh, as you know, I've recently taken over from my colleague Billy McLaren as uh, Acting Lobbying Registrar. You may also remember, or some members of the committee will remember, that Billy appeared before the committee in September to discuss preparations for implementation of the Lobbying Scotland Act. At that time, there was a need to make a lobbying resolution and to issue directions to the Commissioner for Ethical Standards as part of those preparations. I'm pleased to say that those elements are now confirmed. Since then, we've announced the intention to bring the Act into force on the 12th of March 2018. And from 23rd October this year, a couple of weeks ago, we've made the new Lobbying Register website available for a four-month familiarisation period to allow potential registrants uh, to prepare for the Act coming into force. So the purpose of my appearance before you today is to ask you to consider the draft parliamentary guidance which the Act requires the Parliament to produce in order to support organisations which will need to use the lobbying register. The Act requires the Parliament to consult the Scottish Ministers uh, on this guidance before it can be finalised. You've also been uh, provided with a copy of a draft code of conduct for persons lobbying members of the Parliament. Again, this is a requirement of the Act, uh, although in this case Scottish Ministers don't need to be consulted on the terms of that code. Uh, the code is intended to be a set of high-level principles for anyone who lobbies MSPs, and mirrors in many respects the rules contained in Section 5 of the Code of Conduct for MSPs on lobbying and access. Both documents uh, have been produced in collaboration with a lobbying register working group, which the lobbying registrar formed earlier this year. The group includes representatives from a wide range of stakeholder organisations, uh, including public affairs professionals, third sector representatives and pro-transparency organisations. The Lobbying Register team has valued greatly the input and support that we've received from all members of the group uh, during the development of the two documents that you have before you today. They've provided constructive suggestions and feedback from the sectors each represents. Um, as part of your consideration of the draft parliamentary guidance, um, I need to draw to your attention one minor change which the working group has identified uh, needs to be made, um, and that is on page 16 of the guidance document that you have in your papers. Uh, in the section relating to events, in the fourth paragraph, uh, the reference to staff should actually be to employees or other office holders, uh, and that's in order to ensure it reflects accurately the terms of the Act. So uh, it's really just to draw that to your attention. Um, and on that specific point, convener, um, I'll conclude my opening remarks and I'll happily take questions from the committee. Thank you very much. Um, are there any opening questions, Ms Forbes? Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Um, in terms of uh, just a, a brief summary on um, what you think are the most important aspects for MSPs to be aware of, um, how they act and what they say, um, what, what would be the, 
the top issues that you would identify from a, an MSP or an MSP's officer's perspective? So, um, the first thing I think to uh, be clear about is that the Act places the onus on uh, organisations who are lobbying MSPs to take action, and that is to register communications which comply with the definition in the Act of regulated lobbying. And they'll need to register those communications on the lobbying register from the 12th of March. That doesn't mean that uh, MSPs, um, ministers um, and others, special advisers and the permanent secretary, don't have a role in ensuring that the Act is um, implemented properly. Because clearly, when you're having those communications, you're having those conversations with uh, those lobbying you, you want to be aware that uh, that's the nature of the conversation that's taking place. So if it's helpful, the definition of regulated lobbying is um, communication made orally, so uh, must be sp um, spoken word, um, or using uh, signs, British Sign Language or other signs, um, in person, so face-to-face -face meetings, with MSPs, Scottish Government, ministers or law officers, special advisers in the Scottish Government and the Scottish Government's Permanent Secretary. And they need to be communicating about either Scottish Government or parliamentary functions. And then the Act becomes a little bit more complex because there are a number of exemptions to those um, particular uh, to that definition. Um, so some communications will be exempt. But I think we're hoping that MSPs will help to promote the, the Act to those that they engage with, um, at least to ensure that they're aware that they may have an obligation to register meetings. And then, of course, you'll be interested in the register entries that relate to meetings that you have. Um, and we're ensuring that the system um, will allow us to alert you when um, a meeting is registered that you have uh, participated in. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah sure. uh, brief supplementary, just in terms of, um, you, you mentioned that it uh, needs to be um, oral communications, so therefore uh, not written. Is there any scope in which written communications could prove at all to be to fall within this? Um, considering so a lot of information comes via email, etc. And then secondly, also on content, um, in terms of it being specifically related to an MSP's function, a lot of, it's my view that a lot of um, discussions, um, there's a lot of grey areas in terms of whether things relate specifically to an MSP's function, or there are sometimes social comments, social conversations and again just did you have any guidance on first of all the written communications and secondly if you were at uh, at something and having a conversation over a quick cup of coffee okay so um, I think I can clear up the first point very quickly um, written communications are not captured uh, under the act they are excluded from the definition it is purely uh, oral face-to-face -face, uh, engagement so uh, no written um, communication whether it be email letters uh, tweets, even none of that is covered by the Lobbying Scotland Act. In terms of uh, when regulated lobbying could take place, then uh, it could happen in more social settings, uh, need not be in formal meetings, but it would still need to comply with the definition in the Act. So, um, a sort of casual, um, hello, how are you, um, you know, uh, how are you getting on in your role, etc., that would not constitute regulated lobbying because it would not be uh, someone seeking to, uh, if you like, inform or influence you in respect of either your parliamentary role or in, if you were a minister in a, in a ministerial uh, capacity. So um, it's not to say that in social occasions regulated lobbying couldn't take place, but someone would be having to take the opportunity to talk to you about your um, uh, your sort of working role as an MSP and seeking to inform or influence you in that respect. Uh, is that supplementary, yes, on supplementary on that supplementary issue, Mr Arthur? Yeah. Thank you, Kevin, and good morning, Diggy. Just specifically on the distinction between oral and written communications, if I put forward the following scenario, an MSP is having a conversation socially with a trade member of a trade union or a member of a, a policy office of a third sector body, and they're having a conversation about what doesn't constitute lobbying. And then the person from the trade union of the third sector pulls out a bit of paper, writes something down, folds it and hands it over to the MSP. That's a written communication. It is not oral. Does that count as lobbying? Um, the 
passing to you of a, a written note uh -huh. in those circumstances um, I'm clear would not be caught by the definition of regulated lobbying and the information you were passed in that note would not need to be registered no so if the person said something orally then that would constitute a piece of lobbying if they wrote it down in a bit of paper and handed it to me it would not count as lobbying um, I think technically you're correct yes thank you for that clarification can I ask, um, since you mentioned the face-to-face -face part of it, um, obviously a telephone call in this situation wouldn't count as lobbying, but if someone did a Skype video message um, conversation, would, would that be included? Can be a, yes, I should have been clear about that. Um, the Act does include uh, use of um, video conference uh, facilities, and that would include Skype or another form of video conferencing. Yes. Okay. Um, is this a supplementary on this issue? Can I bring in Mr Stewart, Mr Harvey, and then I'll bring in Thank you, Kanina, and uh, thank you, Dougie. I, I, you know, I think having the guidelines is, is very useful because our, our roles and our responsibilities mean f that we do require to meet, discuss and exchange views and opinions. That's very much part of the, the role we have. But, but can I ask for some clarity when it comes to specific speeches uh, that may well be performed uh, and that how, how that may constitute regulated lobbying because there, there will be occasions when that may then uh, fall into that category? Yes, absolutely. The g guidance does include a, a section that explains um, how speeches might be caught under the definition of regulated lobbying. So um, at an event where uh, an organisation is speaking and MSPs, ministers or special advisors are present and the person giving the speech uh, is seeking to inform or influence the people present in the audience um, through the means of that speech, then they would probably need to register that uh, under uh, the terms of the Act um, as an instance of regulated lobbying. They would do so on the register by um, identifying uh, those persons who were present um, and those who were uh, essentially they were directing their remarks towards. Um, and in, those, in that respect, it would be one information return under the Act um, which would um, spell out um, what the purpose of the lobbying was through g giving the speech and who um, had essentially received that information. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Is that supplementary on that issue? No. Um, Thanks. Not. Oh, All right. Right. Okay, I've got All right. another couple of members waiting to come in. Sorry, so I'll take Mr. Harvey. Uh, good morning. Um, Thanks for the work that's been done on this. Uh, there are obviously some complexities and grey areas to all of this, so having having a clear document that helps people navigate that is is obviously hugely important. I um uh, I liked the provision of a flowchart uh, that allows people to go through some nice simple questions uh, that help them to decide for themselves uh, whether uh, the activity they're doing would be counted as as regulated lobbying. Uh, I'm wondering, though, why slightly different forms of words have been used in between the flowchart and some of the other sections. So, for example, step four in the flowchart, uh, I am paid by the organisation I lobbied for or represent. Uh, a, I think two pages earlier, uh, this would be page 11, um, it said, uh, step four, you are a paid individual representing the views of your organisation. For somebody, for example, who works for a supermarket uh, and uh, the regulations uh, surrounding um, plastic bags, for example, were being debated, uh, they might have a, a view that they want to express that they feel is as an individual. Uh, but as far as I understand, if they're, if they're communicating about a policy issue uh, which the organisation that pays them, even if they're not paid to lobby, uh, if, they're, if, they're, if they're paid by that organisation and it also has a view and they're communicating that view even as an individual, it would still count as regulated lobbying. And I just wonder whether the slight difference in, in wording there might give some confusion. I note the difference in wording. Um I can't immediately um, explain why we've got a difference there. It may simply be to um, accommodate um, a shorter uh, phrase within the flowchart, um, but I will go back and, and examine that. Um, however, to, uh, I think, answer your substantive question, um, I think the example you give um, would not oblige the individual concerned uh, to 
at all engage on the lobbying register or have to register anything um, if they were um, not communicating on behalf of their employer, but rather simply offering a personal view. Um, it is clear that the, the onus is on the organisation um, to register um, an account on the, the lobbying register um, and to take responsibility for communications made by uh, its staff or other office holders. Um, it, uh, there is an exemption in the Act for um, people um, engaging with those that are covered by the Act, MSPs obviously being a, a critical um, constituency there, um, when they're essentially communicating on their own behalf and purely on their own behalf. So the fact that someone was a paid employee of a supermarket um, and happened to um, have views about something, um, a, a matter of uh, public interest that obviously um, had a bearing on the work that their organisation or the, the business that their organisation was in. If they're not communicating on behalf of that organisation in that conversation, then they probably um, are not engaged in regulated lobbying. So I will happily look at the slight change in uh, difference in wording between flowchart and the other parts of the guidance there. We might make a, a minor adjustment, um, Mr Harvey, um, but I'm pretty confident that in the circumstances you describe, the individual concern would not need to register. Yeah. It also comes up in page 19, uh, where it says, um, if you do so, this lobbying communication, if you do so as an individual or employee, um, let's try to get past the closed brackets, uh, then in return for payment of any kind, then you are required to register. That is the position regardless of whether the payment itself relates to making lobbying communications. And again, it, it just gives rise to that slight ambiguity. The, the first part of that paragraph suggests that if, if the lobbying communication is oh. paid for, then you're required to register. And the second sentence okay. says that's the position regardless of whether the payment relates to making the lobbying communication. So uh, again, somebody who's paid by an organization for other purposes, yeah. uh, you know, yes. stacking shells, administering the, the payroll, whatever, uh, in that example, might find it difficult to interpret that. Um, again, happy to, to look at the, that specific example there. And um, what that, I think is intended to try to capture is that um, some um, individuals um, will need to register on the lobbying register because they may, in effect, be sole traders who are engaged in um, consultant lobbying, um, let's say, um, that essentially they are operating on behalf of, of, of others. What the guidance is trying to uh, interpret here and, and try to explain is the fact that there is an exemption in the Act for uh, anyone who um, engages in lobbying um, but is in an, in an unpaid capacity. So that was particularly, I think, um, meant to ensure that um, people who perhaps are unpaid um, board members of small charities, etc., would not be caught by the definition of regulated lobbying. But um, I see the point that you make in terms of that uh, particular passage in the, the draft guidance, um, and we can look to make sure that that's made um, a little bit more clear. Thanks. I just wanted as well to ask about the journalism exemption. Yes. Uh, and um, I think most of us would would be fairly, fairly clear about the, the everyday use of the word journalism. Uh, but would that, for example, cover a trade magazine for an organisation uh, which itself was lobbying? Uh, and um, obviously MSPs would quite often be approached for perhaps a bit of blurb for a conference they're speaking at where a trade magazine is, is promoting it. Um, uh, would that be seen as communication on behalf of the organisation? Or would it be seen as journalism? So I, I think that would very much depend on the, the facts and circumstances. And um, we'll obviously, as the, the lobbying register team, stand ready to offer uh, advice on specific examples. But um, I think that this exemption was clearly intended to exclude from registration um, the regular um, communication between politicians um, and other um, others covered in the Act um, from journalists acting very much in their professional capacity as a journalist. Um, we understand that there are some um, organisations out there um, who have um, perhaps somewhat blurred the lines between journalism and other activities. I think they will need to be um, very clear that when they are communicating, 
um, whether they are doing so on uh, for the purposes of journalism, i.e. something they're going to write a, a news story about, in which case the exemption will apply, or whether they are actually um, engaging with that uh, politician or, or other person um, for another purpose. Um, if it's not clear that it's for the purpose of journalism, then they may well need to register that communication. So the general advice would be err on the side of caution and, and register if you're uncertain? It, certainly, um, and we will um, be happy to explore with um, individuals or organisations um, any uh, you know, questions they have about the distinction. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sir Akro Johnson, you had a question? Uh, yes, um, th thank you very much. I sh should also, I think, probably just declare an interest in that I'm still um, a director of a lobbying company which is in abeyance but is hasn't been struck off formally yet, but it is about to be just taking longer than we thought. Um, Dougie, it's probably a very uh, simple one, but um, if uh, an MSP is in an event and a, um, an, orga uh, an individual from either a lobbying organisation or on behalf of a log lobbying organisation uh, says, look, I wanted to catch you briefly, can we set up a meeting uh, on behalf of my organisation or uh, organisation A with a view to discussing this issue they have very, very briefly, but there is obviously, it's an oral communication but it is to uh, it is to organise a formal sit down meeting, which will be registered. Would that initial discussion have to be registered too? So, as you've described it, that um, very brief, um, essentially, request to um, uh, request to meet at a later date would not, um, I think, meet the the test that we've set out in the flowchart that you've seen, the, the five key steps as we've described them um, to try to help people to determine what is and isn't regulated lobbying, uh, on the basis that it's simply um, a communication which will um, uh, lead to some further uh, engagement and, and communication. Um, but in that instance, um, the, at that stage, they have not uh, sought to inform or influence you in any way, um, but there, as you say, there may be an expectation that when the meeting takes place, and uh, the for more formal meeting takes place, that the, that conversation might need to be registered. Might that change depending on how much information they, or background they gave you to the to the case? So if they, well, if, if they yeah. said, just to give you brief background, it's regards to if they're having a problem with this organisation. Possibly. I think you're, you're right. There, there is um, the, there's some sort of spectrum of um, how much information is relayed in that uh, initial communication. If they are... Um, uh, you know, asking you to do something, take some action in the interim, um, or to um, consider something, um, uh, you know, as a result of that conversation, that might be regulated lobbying. Um, if it's purely, um, while I've got you for a couple of seconds, can we get a date in the diary? That certainly would not constitute regulated lobbying. Thank you. Um, could I possibly ask about the constituency exemption? Um, that was... Um, Stage three amendment, I think, to the bill at the time, um, and and whether you think that will um, possibly lead to a situation where companies that are working across all constituencies in Scotland end up being exempt from having to register any of their communication with MSPs. Convener, it's one of the um, parts of the Act that um, is certainly proving most challenging to produce guidance on or to provide advice to um, people about. Um, you're absolutely right. Um, it was a, a stage three uh, government amendment that introduced this particular um, exemption. And to explain, um, it would exempt from registration um, communications which are made to uh, MSP for constituency or region in which um, a, person, a person's business is ordinarily carried on a person's activity is ordinarily carried on or the individual's residence. So that could uh, lead essentially to um, businesses or other um, organisations that have a nationwide presence potentially being exempt from registering communications to MSPs um, uh, who represent those constituencies or regions, um, regardless of the topic. Um, so I should be clear, it doesn't need to be focused on constituency-related business. It could be on any matter. Um, now, there is an important exception to that, and that is any such communication um, to a constituency or regional MSP who also happens to be a Scottish Government Minister, um, those communications do need to be registered. The exemption doesn't apply in, in that case. 
Um, and I think the other important uh, part of that exemption is that if uh, the person communicating is making the communication on behalf of a third party, so they're representing someone else, then the exemption doesn't apply. So it's quite complicated, um, not entirely straightforward to, to explain, but um, I think it, we will have to wait and see. Experience will tell us um, what the sort of consequences of the introduction of this amendment uh, late in the day are, are likely to be. Um, I know I think Mr Harvey had a, um, a competing or a, a, an amendment to the amendment in that uh, particular, uh, was debated at that time. Um, we are obviously standing ready to provide advice on it, um, and you'll know that uh, in two years' time there must be a statutory, the statutory requirement of a review of the Act. I think this will be one of the areas that will certainly need to be looked at carefully. Okay, thank you very much. And um, it, it, my final question is just about some of the um, press um, that was um, in the. Um, the media a, a couple of weeks ago about the makeup of the working group, and I just wondered if you wanted to to make any comment about how mm. you, how you feel the working group's progressing. Yes, mm. it was a deliberate decision by my predecessor to to form the working group in order to um, really gather the views of a wide range of stakeholders, those that really will have to engage with the act. Um, so it felt appropriate that we should look to have representatives from uh, key sectors that um, you know, would be able to offer um, a view uh, on behalf of different uh, organisations that will have to um, essentially work with us to register the, the, the details on, on the register. So we have business organisations, third sector uh, organisations represented, obviously PRPA consultancies uh, there because they have a, a strong interest, but also a, a pro-transparency um, uh, essentially campaigner. So we've tried to strike um, a balance there to get the views from all those that have a, a really clear interest in making this act work in practice. And they have been very, very helpful in, um, I think, assisting us in preparing the documents that you've had before you today. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Mr Johnson, you had a question? Yes. And, and, and in essence, my question follows on from Patrick Harvey's line of questioning. And I, and I you know, Hear what you're saying in terms of the distinction between a, an employee having a conversation um, with, a, with an MSP uh, by chance as compared to, to somebody who may be senior in an organisation. And I think I've got sort of two comments here. First of all, I think the wording on page 19 uh, and paragraph 5 of the communications not made in return for payment, uh, I, I think I'm not sure that the wording actually brings that out. Now, if I refer to paragraph 5 in particular, it, 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 it might lead someone to believe that any employee, you know, receiving remuneration from a company and having a conversation is subject law. So I would just suggest on that technical point that, that that could do with clarifying. But I think the more general point I would make is that I think there's an assumption in this section that it's, it's very clear that you're either an employee or you're a, or you're a director that you're either a sort of a junior person or a senior person. I, I would argue that in a, in a number of organisations, um, both big and small, that that's that's not always clear. You know, I, you know. I, so we, we we talked about you know people working in, on the shop counters compared to the managing directors of a supermarket. But where where does a store manager lie uh, in that? You know, so store managers do have responsibility for making communications. Are they liable? And I, I'm just and that for 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 some organisations, I think could be very complicated and I think even for smaller organizations again that that sort of middle tier of responsibility I, I think is a, a big gray area I was just wondering what your thoughts were on that I very much take on board um, the concern you raised there um, but I think we can and we are trying to make it clear um, for uh, all those organizations that um, need to be aware of the requirements of, of the act and um, just who um, might be uh, caught by the definition and, and who will be exempt um, I think we are following in large part the terms of the definition contained in the act um, which references um, communications made um, in a, a role either as an employee, and that would capture everyone from, as you've described, shop floor to senior management, but if you're an employee of an organisation, and then it mentions specifically director or shadow director in terms of companies, um, or other office holder, partner or member, and that's to try and 
Um, I think capture the, the various roles that could be played by a person who might be engaged in uh, regulated lobbying um, if they perhaps are uh, operating not on behalf of a company but on behalf of a, a partnership or perhaps um, uh, another uh, association or charitable organisation. So um, in many respects we have to always um, be um, referring back to the Act itself. The guidance is an attempt to, I suppose, put that in um, easier to understand language. I think this point on page 19 that you've identified um, could be clearer. Uh, but what is very um, clear is that individuals um, who are communicating on their own behalf, um, and that would include coming to your MSP surgeries, coming to see you in, in Parliament, um, they are exempt under um, the very first exemption in the schedule to the Act. Um, and then thereafter, uh, it becomes a little bit more complicated when you've got to consider some of the other exemptions that apply. But very much on that particular point, a communication made by an individual on the individual's own behalf would be exempt and would not need to be registered. I understand that, and, and, I, and I, I, I recognise this as work in progress, but similarly, and, and actually following on to the, the, the next section on communications by small organisations, again, I worry that there's, a, there's an assumption here that it's clear when a, an organisation is small com as compared to when it is large. And, and, and you know, for example, um, many partnerships are actually comprised of different legal entities, with the partners being uh, 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 partners of one entity and the employees being employed by a separate entity. Um, I, I was just wondering what, what consideration had been given to that. And, and then likewise, I, I, I slightly worry, and I, indeed I think I note there is probably even a, 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 a note of worry in, in this section about whether or not there's actually a little bit of a loophole for the, the small organisations if they're actually sort of funded by other organisations and not necessarily explicitly uh, for lobbying purposes, but, but nonetheless... Uh, you know, could be used as a vehicle to do so. It, it, for, on the first point, is that something that you'd considered and how would that get caught? And on the second point, is that, is that sort of a point that's going to be actively un, under review, looking at actually what entities and structures uh, these organisations might end up using? Well, we are very much engaging in this familiarisation period with a lot of organisations who are um, coming to us to... Um, essentially for the first time engage directly with the, the lobbying register and what they're going to have to um, submit uh, when it goes live in March next year. Um, we are finding that, um, as you would expect, there are uh, some organisations that are more uh, established in a more complex manner than, than others um, and we're sometimes um, having to think carefully about what advice to give as to um, actually who's obliged to register. Uh, or maybe obliged to register what. So, um, in terms of the small um, organisations exemption, um, that was, uh, I think, an attempt um, to by the government to um, exclude from registration the requirement to register um, organisations that, that have obviously fewer than 10 full-time equivalent employees, um, but at the same time uh, making sure that that did not exempt uh, those small organisations in terms of employees and staff um, who actually um, are representing a wider sort of membership. Um, so uh, I think specifically quoted were some of the business organisations, etc., who may have a, a few core staff but actually have a, a wider membership. So that does and can cause um, complexity. Um, we have, uh, I think, tried to be as clear as possible in terms of what is meant by... Um, you know, representative, um, but very clear also that if they are um, lobbying on behalf of a third party, then they can't rely on this particular exemption. So we'll have to keep it under review. Um, I think it is another one of the parts of the Act that will be examined carefully again in two years' time um, based on experience. Um, and that's hopefully what we're going to gather in this familiarisation period. We will, in addition to the parliamentary guidance you have before you today, we will produce um, uh, frequently asked questions and sort of common scenarios as they emerge. We'll keep those um, updated, hopefully to build on the, the sort of body of knowledge and experience we've got so that people will be able to interpret the Act um, more easily. My, my, my um, final question, and it really comes back to remuneration. I mean, I think the the the, the uh, Federation of Small uh, Business, and I sorry, I should declare an interest there that I'm uh, a member of, of that organisation. I think I have a particular worry because they have uh, regional office holders who receive small payment 
for carrying out their, their rules. It's not necessarily directly uh, related to expenses, although I think probably historically that has been what it's for. Um, and, and the nature of their role is not, certainly not explicitly about lobbying, but, but, but that will um, you know, form part of their activities, albeit in a sort of a low informal level. I was just wondering, both, both in that specific point and actually whether or not there's a general point there and just what, what conversations and thinking have been going into that point. Yes, the unpaid, uh, or the exemption that relates to communications not made in return for payment, um, Again, when you uh, start to explore in detail some of these um, uh, potential um, sort of difficult situations um, uh, arise, and I am aware of the one that you uh, mentioned there, um, the Act does define in that exemption what payment means, and it means, it says here, means payment of any kind, whether made directly or indirectly for making the communication. So in that sense, um, someone who may um, at face value appear to be an unpaid uh, board member, uh, trustee, for example, um, could actually, um, and, and might then uh, uh, might appear that a communication they make would not need to be registered, may in fact have to register um, a communication um, because they have, for example, received some honorarium payment, um, may have um, perhaps received some other uh, fee at, at, at some point. So um, we'll simply have to we have asked and we will continue to ask um, organisations to look closely at the payments they make to um, uh, office holders within the organisation to check that. I should say that it would not include um, reimbursement for travel, subsistence um, or other expenses um, incurred, um, but anything beyond that, any payment beyond that um, might then uh, require them to register communication that they made. Okay, are there any further questions? Uh, thank you very much. Um, obviously, there were a, a couple of issues there that may result in a, a tweak of the, the guidance. Can you give us a time scale when you expect to be able to make a decision on that? Uh, convener, with your uh, agreement, I would be happy to write to you within the week um, to give you um, details of what adjustment we might make there. Um, and thereafter, um, I think we are uh, hoping that uh, you would then um, be the person who would write to um, offer, if you like, this draft to the Scottish Ministers for their consultation. And when we have their response, we will obviously reflect on any comments that, that they have, and that will then lead us towards a final version of the guidance. Okay. Can I thank you very much for your attendance at today's meeting. Um, can I just invite the committee to agree that process, that when we hear back from them, we will then... Um, follow through and um, agree to issue parliamentary guidance to Scottish ministers for formal consultation. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, thank you for your attendance. Thank I'll just you suspend. Much. Thank you. We now move to agenda item five. It's for the committee to consider whether to accord recognition to the proposed CPG on consumer protection for home energy efficiency and renewable energy. I'll take any comments from the committee before? Happy to Are we con content to support that CPG? Yeah, that's um, very helpful. Thank you very much. Um, and just before we move into... Um, the private session, um, I would like to um, thank Daniel Johnson for his contribution to the committee. Daniel has very diligently, having raised the issue of gender equality on the committee as we move forward, um, has um, submitted his resignation. This will be his last meeting. So thank you very, very much for your contribution and best wishes in your future committee responsibilities. Um, we now move into private session.